Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Jane Pickering. I'm the executive director of the Harvard Museums of Science and Culture, uh, a member of which is the Harvard Museum of Natural History that's sponsoring tonight's lecture. And I'd like to welcome you all. Um, I'm looking forward to this. Bob Hazen is talking to us about from the Big Bang to Broadway and how things evolve. Um, I actually am introducing Andy Knoll, Professor Andy Knoll, who is introducing Bob. So I'm going to try and be really short because I know you're here to hear him, not me. Uh, but having said that, I still have some things to say. Of course, um, what museum director doesn't have something to say? So. Uh, this is the fourth installment of our lecture series, Evolution Matters. I'm sure many of you have been to the others that we have. We have one more in this series um, on April the 10th, when a Professor of Ecology at the University of Minnesota, Marlene Zook, is going to talk actually about how our culture is often distracted by pseudo-scientific fads about a time when we were more in sync with nature and argues that evolution has no perfect end point or no perfect product, uh, which is going to be very interesting, I think. And I would encourage you, if you haven't already, to give us your email address so we can send you announcements. And also on the table to the side, there's information on how you can become a museum member and ha have lots of benefits, but also help support programs like this. And speaking of support, our sponsors for the whole Evolutions Matters, Evolution Matters lecture series, Dr. Herman and Joan Suit, unfortunately couldn't be with us, but we do acknowledge their support, which has made this, this series possible. Uh, I also remind you that tonight's talk, along with others, are posted on the museum's website. And also that we do have Bob's book, The Story of Earth, The First 4.5 Billion Years from Stardust to Living Planet, available. And I'm sure Bob will be happy to sign them for you, but they are also available on the side there. Um, one thing I should say is that this book has been heavily uh, consulted for the museum's new Earth and Planetary Science Gallery. Uh, which will be opened in about three or four weeks. We have an opening talk by Professor Francis MacDonald on April 4th, and that will also, that day, will give you an opportunity to come and see the, the new permanent gallery we've been working on where we've used um, Dr. Hazen's work. Uh, and also, I can add uh, Professor Knoll, who is down there, who's coming up in just a second when I stop waffling on, who has also been involved um, with that new gallery. We're very excited about it. It's a total reimagining of all those wonderful mineral specimens that you've, everyone's been looking at for many years. And just to quickly say that Professor Knoll is himself a world authority on Precambrian microfossils and has long-standing interests in geobiology and paleobotany. His interests extend, like Dr. Hazen's, beyond this planet as well, and he is principal investigator of the NASA National <laughs> Astrobiology Institute team at Harvard and a member of the Mars Exploration Rover science team as well. So I'd like to welcome Dr. Noel up to the podium. Thank you, Jane, and good evening, everyone. You know, one of the nice things about being in the orbit of Harvard is that on any given day, you might be able to listen to a distinguished scientist. You might be able to hear a world-class musician. You might listen to a uh, best-selling author or learn from a distinguished and innovative educator. Well, tonight, we're going to make it easy to do all of these because Bob Hazen is in in fact, well described by every one of those things. Bob's academic life, at least, begins in Cambridge with a uh, bachelor's and master's from MIT and a PhD from Harvard. And I did want to show one picture from the historic archives. This is from uh, the uh, talent show contest in the 1974 Harvard Geology Club. And the uh, person on the right is a very young Stephen Jay Gould. 
next to him is uh, Dick Saylor, who still lives in, in Belmont, Massachusetts. The long-haired skinny guy is me. And the uh, dashing bearded Renaissance looking person is Bob Hazen. Uh, now, it's, it's kind of hard to see where you go from this once you've been in this, this sort of thing. But Bob has, has managed. He uh, has, after getting his PhD from Harvard, he went to the Carnegie Geophysical Labs where he has had a distinguished career as a mineralogist, mineral physicist. Um, he also, fairly early in his career, became interested in broader issues in education and a book that he wrote with Jim Treffel called uh, Science Matters has really helped to ensure science uh, literacy in hundreds of thousands of high school and college students. He's written a number of, of other books. Um, we heard about Bob's latest book, The Story of Earth. He has an engaging book on the uh, origin of life called Genesis. And uh, given the fact that Bob is also a, a professional trumpeter, there is, of course, a book called The Music Man, an illustrated history of brass bands in America. So we're not going to hear about all of these things tonight, but uh, we're going to hear about one of, of Bob's passions for, for education. Uh, those of us who were here yesterday in a departmental colloquium heard about Bob's reimagining of mineralogy to make it be less of a just cubbyhole type of, of discipline and one that really encompasses the evolution of earth and life in, a, in an integrated way. He is also the executive director of a new uh, Sloan Foundation sponsored project called Deep Carbon Observatory that you see in the bottom right, which is an, an effort to understand carbon as it exists throughout our planet's interior. We tend to think of the carbon cycle as only being something at the surface, but uh, Bob is leading the effort to understand the role that different forms of carbon play uh, throughout the interior of our planet. And he has long been interested in complexity and the related subject of how things evolve. And so tonight, we're going to hear from the Big Bang to Broadway, Bob Hazen. Evolution. Evolution. There's perhaps no other topic that causes such tension between science and religion. For many Americans, the first chapter of the Bible is enough. God created heavens and earth. God created plants and animals. God created us in his own image. For many scientists, though, they want to know more. They, they want to know how God did it. And so <laughs> we come to the rhetorical challenge of holding civil discussions with people that hold very different views. Many, many places around the country where I've lectured in Texas and in Kansas and Iowa and in Virginia, people ask me, do you believe in evolution? And it turns out this is a terribly flawed question. It's flawed for two reasons. It's flawed, first of all, because of the semantic problem of what do you mean by evolution? And there are many, many different definitions, and so you have to agree on those terms. But more fundamentally, it's flawed because science isn't about believing in evolution. It's a matter of weighing evidence that has accumulated over 150 years by hundreds of thousands of biologists, masses of evidence that point to mechanisms by which a non-living world can become living and then evolve to the present state. And yet, I would warrant that every one of us in the next year is going to meet someone who asks or thinks a question like this. Some of them are going to be fundamentalists in a way where discussions are difficult. But many people are seriously troubled by this question of, of how can we look at the modern living world? How can we look at the physiological complexity of organisms? How can we see the biochemical complexity? They're, they're probably some people in this room that have questions, maybe a biochemistry student who is suddenly learning about some of the, the cycles, some of the enzymes that are so 
incredibly complex. So how can that arise by some natural process of selection? Well, so this is not, this is not a good question for those two reasons, and we're going, to, we're going to move on. What I want to do tonight is do six things. I want to try to define evolution. I want to explore some possible alternatives to evolution that are out there that have to be part of any conversation that you have. I want to introduce the concept of emergent complexity, which is one of the natural processes by, by way things become complex over time. The sort of meat of the talk is presenting some examples of evolving systems, and not simply biology, but other ones as well. But then focus on this very unique and important question of Darwinian evolution by the process of natural selection. And finally, I'd like to conclude by telling you why I believe in evolution. <laughs> it's funny how many audiences don't laugh at that. <laughs> Um, they just, so, so I'm enjoying this a lot. Okay, what's, so what's evolution? Well, evolution, most basically, the most fundamental first definition is change over time. So, so that's zero. But most people mean something more. Generally, when people talk about an evolving system, they mean a system that becomes more interesting over time, more diverse, more complex, more patterned in some way. However you define that, even if it isn't easy to quantify what structure, or diversity, or complexity really means. Also, most evolving systems we think of as having something called congruency. That is, each stage of the process depends in some way on what came before. So there's a sequential aspect to evolving systems. It's not just random events. OK. Common descent is very commonly worked into an evolutionary sequence. It's extremely important in biology, but not part of every evolving system, as you'll see. And then, of course, for biological systems, this idea of passing on information from one generation to the next, to having mutations in the selection process, the Darwinian definition. And so most people, if they say, do you believe in evolution? I think they're really talking about the fifth one. But remember that there's nuances here. And there are many kinds of evolving systems that don't display all five of these characteristics. So let me, I, I, I want to emphasize, I'm not really setting up a straw man here. I realize that with this audience, and you, you were, you're with me, but recognize that there is tremendous tension in this country. In my classes at George Mason University, where I teach scientific literacy, fully 50% of the students claim they do not accept evolution as a scientific or natural process. So this is really, so what are the possible alternatives of course, life could have been a miracle. God created life. And if so, of course, it is not subject to scientific study. A miracle is, by definition, a violation of natural law. If you go outside natural law, it's something we can't study in the laboratory. It's also possible that life is an incredibly improbable thing. There's a chance just to supposition if you think that there's a billion, trillion Earth-like planets in the cosmos and it occurs only once, then again, it's going to be awfully hard for a graduate student to demonstrate some significant step in the origin of life in a four-year thesis program. <laughs> now, for most of us who do origin of life research, we are philosophically in this camp. We have staked our claim that it's an inevitable consequence of chemistry. If you have an Earth-like planet, if you have basalt, if you have water-rock interactions, then life follows as one of those chemical steps that, if, if not certain on a world, is highly probable. Life is a cosmic imperative. And, and there are other arguments, too. There's also this idea of intelligent design. And I think we need to be aware of all of these and be able to articulate our stand on, on what we think is the most likely case based on the evidence. So what scientists will say is that life is an example of something called chemical evolution. It arose by a series of steps, something I'm going to call emergent complexity, step by step. And that you can actually test this hypothesis in the laboratory by doing experiments step by step through various chemical steps, going from simplicity of a geochemical world, trying to achieve the complexity of a biochemical world. Now, of course, intelligent design is another point of view. The idea that if you're walking along and you find a wristwatch, you look at it and you say, my gosh, the wristwatch has all these incredibly complicated gears and different materials and so forth. And there's just no question there was an engineer. And even if we don't know who designed or built the watch, we assume that there was an intelligent designer. People apply the same logic to cells and to the biological world. Well, this hypothesis is, is difficult for science because it assumes that there's a supernatural 
creator or at least someone who's invisible to us. You don't say who that creator really was. Well, how do you respond to intelligent design? The, the basic way as a scientist you do it is you design a research program that shows step by step going from simplicity to complexity where each step is a totally natural and often deterministic process and therefore if you can show this, if you can show the complexity arises spontaneously through some natural process then you do not need to resort to intelligent design. A really good example if you ever have to argue this point is Stonehenge. You know there's a whole literature out there about how space aliens help to build Stonehenge. And you know the flying saucers came and they lift up these heavy stones and they set them in place because oh no a primitive society would be so difficult for them to do it. But you can also imagine how primitive societies could through hard work if you had about a thousand able-bodied people if they spent decades doing this they have stone tools they have wood they have ropes you could in fact imagine a process by which Stonehenge is made. And therefore using Occam's razor this idea that you you accept the most parsimonious explanation for any natural phenomenon or anything you observe you, you don't resort to space aliens. But remember <laughs> that none of us none of us can prove none of us can prove that space aliens didn't play a role here. And so this has to be more of a philosophical than you can't prove it. So it has to be an argument that's based on, on some kind of logical reasoning. And, and I think that's a really nice aspect of having these conversations with people who have doubts about evolution or other scientific ideas because you, you engage in kind of uh, reasoned discourse. So emergent complexity. This is the process by which complex systems can become, uh, simple systems can become complex. And it's, it's basically an idea of imposing patterning on a system with lots of interacting particles which in the business are called agents. They can be sand grains, they can be stars, they can be neurons, they can be individual ants in an ant colony. So many different examples of this exist. And when they interact, for example, each sand grain does not think of itself as part of a dune. It's just reacting to forces, gravitational forces, contact forces, wind or water flowing over the surface. And what you get is ripples and dunes. You get braided patterns and, and all sorts of intriguing uh, patterned environments when you have a sandy terrain. At much larger scale of stars, each individual star is just experiencing the gravitational potential of its, its neighbors, particularly influenced by the nearest neighbors, and yet the collective patterning that results, the spiral arms and the central bulge, is, is something that, that is an emergent aspect that's not characteristic of any one star. The most complex emergent system we know is the brain. You have uh, billions of neurons that are complexly interconnected, each one, each one neuron responding to its local environment. Again, albeit a complex environment, the result is consciousness. No one neuron is conscious, and yet we see this emergent complexity. We see these kinds of systems all around us all the time. My favorite is slime mold, what are called social amoebas, which live most of their lives as isolated cells, but during certain times of the year, they send out signals, they begin to accumulate, they actually form a slug-like thing and they crawl across the forest floor. This is amazing to me that these are single-celled amoebas that do this collectively. And then they form these stalks and new spores come out the top and then they melt back into the forest floor and become single cells again. That's an amazing emergent property. We see emergence at every scale and every kind of system in the natural world. Um, this is a wonderful example of how one can describe an emergent system. Craig Reynolds, uh, many, many decades ago, designed a computer program to mimic the flocking of birds, the schooling of fish, the swarming of insects. And in this case, again, each individual is only responding to a local environment. And so there are selection rules. This gives you an example of how you can mathematically model an emergent system. So what Craig Reynolds says is there are three vectors shown in red here. You can mathematically describe these and you can weight them differently. So the first vector is you don't want to crash into your flock mates. So you stay somewhat away from them. The second is that you want to align, you want to steer in the same direction as your flock mates. And the third is called coherence. It's, it's trying to stay in clumped. And so as you weight these differently, you get different kinds of schooling, flocking, and so forth. So Craig Reynolds designed this little video, which I think is really cool. But this is from long, long time ago. And and you look at this and say, oh, this is just sort of a silly little mathematical exercise. Unless you think that, Craig Reynolds lives in Hollywood and has made a huge amount of money because if you've watched uh, movies like Finding Nemo with Swarming Fish or Jurassic Park with the running dinosaurs and so forth, that's what this is all about. 
And, and we see this in the natural world as well. This is a video of flocking starlings over Rome. We've never seen starlings do this. Once in a while, not here, you can see this. It's, it's really amazing when you see it. But just, it looks like a single organism, but it's individual birds with those three vectors of, of the, you avoid collisions, you want to align yourself in colors, and yeah, the, the audio is kind of funny because it's just like people talking words and stuff. Anyway, I find that really mesmerizing. Uh, okay, so that's an example of emergent complexity with natural systems. And everything I've shown you so far, be it neurons or sand grains or, or starlings, are physical systems, but it doesn't have to be that way. Imagine music as another example of an emergent phenomena where in the agents are individual notes. And there's always selection rules like those three vectors. In music, the selection rules are harmony and counterpoint. And so um, you have those interactions, and what you get is, is music. And imagine me playing you a piece of music right now. Da, 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 da. OK, so, so that's an emergent phenomenon. Um, and we see this at all kinds of scales in living things at the scale of, of molecules, like cell membranes forming. Here we saw cells, remember, the social amoeba. We see it in the social behavior of insects, where each ant is responding to local phenomena. By the way, it used to be thought that the ants are, I shouldn't be talking about ants here, should I? <laughs> I mean, there, there are other people who are more expert than I at Harvard, but, but the, the, the social behavior of these things, they're responding not only to chemical signals, but it was recently found there's little squeaks too. There's actually audio or oral things going on. So that's pretty amazing. But these are ants tending aphids. The, I mean, the ants aren't thinking I'm going to tend an aphid today. They're, I think they're just getting chemical signals, but it's really amazing. And in society, we have all sorts of collective phenomena, including this room full of people, but agriculture and, and sporting events, and my favorite is symphony orchestra, where, again, I mean, an individual trumpet player or violinist can't make a symphony, and yet you put them all together, you get something quite, quite different. OK, now let's talk about a bunch of complex evolving systems. I want to talk about seven of these. First one is the elements and isotopes in the process of nucleosynthesis. Second, mineral evolution. Then prebiotic chemistry, what's called chemical evolution. Then look at languages, material culture, popular culture, and biological evolution. My rhetorical argument is that we see evolving systems all around us, all the time, in all kinds of contexts. So why should living things be any different? So that's, that's where we're going. And there are seven themes that you see over and over and over again in these systems. Now, not every system shows every one of these seven, but these are common sort of aspects of evolving systems. You have species, or types, or kinds. You have some kind of selection process. These are systems in which the components of the system can form vast numbers of configurations. There's, there's combinatorial complexity. And yet there's selection, which selects only a few functioning configurations out of all the possibilities. Lateral transfer of traits is something we see again and again. Diversification through time, niches, punctuation, something that uh, Stephen Jay Gould talked about. We see punctuation in all kinds of evolving systems and extinction. So bear these in mind as we talk about different <laughs> stuff. Elements and isotopes. Elements and isotopes, after the Big Bang, you had only helium and hydrogen, a little bit of lithium. That's represented on this graph, abundance on the vertical scale, and on the horizontal scale is the mass number. So we're talking about elements, you know, one, two, three, four, the very, very simplest, smallest combinations of neutron and protons. And what we're talking about here in nucleosynthesis is the combinatorially rich number of com combinations of neutrons and protons you can put into a nucleus, and then producing new ones through new processes. And the processes that occur are stars. Hydrogen and helium form that first generation of big stars. Inside the stars there are various processes. In our own sun, we have the processes that will produce a modest number just through nuclear fusion reactions. The nuclear fusion reactions get up to iron and a little bit higher. Um, at that point, you have other processes taking place, for example, during supernova explosions, where you have a rapid neutron capture process, which takes you way up into the periodic table. And, and then explosion occurs, and, and then you get 
the full range of isotopes, you know, a few hundred stable isotopes, a couple of thousand, including all the radioactive isotopes. This is a process of complexification over time, and it's a classic example of an evolving system that starts simple, it becomes more complex. There are punctuation events, like a supernova explosion, and so forth. So that's the basic idea. Now you've made the periodic table of the elements. From here, I want to talk about mineral evolution as it occurs on a planet like Earth. And here we're talking about a change over time in many aspects of the near surface mineralogy. The total number of mineral species, the relative abundance of those species, their compositional range, including the trace and minor elements, the isotopes that may incorporate, even the sizes and shapes of minerals. These change radically through deep time of Earth history. We're going to look primarily at diversity of minerals because it's an easy thing to kind of mark progress, if you will, if you want to think of it that way. It was fascinating to me that before we started this study, I'd never heard anyone ask what was the first mineral in the cosmos. You have hydrogen, you have helium, you form big stars, no minerals, it's too hot, hydrogen and helium don't form minerals. So then you have to make other elements. And you make other elements, but they're locked in the stars, so they're too hot. So when can you get the first minerals? Well, it's when those stars either start shedding very energetically their outer envelope, which is carbon rich, or else the star explodes and there's carbon rich envelopes and the first mineral turns out is diamond. And it's diamond because you're at a very, very hot vapor and as that vapor expands, it cools and when it cools to below 4,000 Kelvin, it's cool enough to condense diamond as a vapor phase out of that, that hot, dense gas. So, and then there's a whole series of others. We call these the Ur minerals. The first dozen minerals or so to occur in our cosmos they're a pervasive part of the cosmos. Every dust grain that you find in, in dense molecular clouds out in space have some selection of these. And you find these dust grains, they still fall to Earth. These are the oldest objects we know, much, much predating our sun and our solar system. So these objects contain little bits of these various minerals. And this is what builds planets. And so the question is, how do you get to a dozen, to the 4,700 mineral species that have been identified so far on Earth? So the first thing you need to think about is what processes lead to new minerals, and there's th there three of them. When you separate, you concentrate chemical elements because there are a lot of very rare elements that take a long time to concentrate, primarily through fluid rock interactions. You also, as you're building planets, you have new ranges of temperature pressure, which lead to new mineral phases. And you also have the influence of life, which turns out surprisingly is the single most important factor in the diversification of the mineral kingdom. So here, mineral evolution is framed by these processes. We talk about, the t through Earth history, three stages, three big eras. The planetary accretion is represented by meteorites. Crust and mantle reworking is classic studies of how rocks form through igneous processes and metamorphic processes. And then the era that's influenced by life. So these are all part of it. We can further divide Earth history into a bunch of stages. The very first one is interesting. You, you now have these 12 minerals in the dust grains. And those dust grains and all the gas is forming the big nebular disk and a lot of the material, 99.9% .9 of it's forming the central sun. The rest of it is kind of coalescing into to clumps, little dust bunnies, if you will, in space. And then the sun ignites and it's these pulses of thermal energy that melt um, those dust bunnies into little droplets called chondrules. And so the very earliest meteorites from 4.567 billion years old have these little condensed droplets, and they, so they have very high temperature minerals in them, about 60 different minerals, and also we've gone from 12 to 60. Then these chondrites start clumping together, forming larger bodies, you know, 10, 50, 100 kilometers more in diameter, and when they do that, they start melting. They melt because of the gravitational potential energy that's released, and also because they contain short-lived radionuclides that release a lot of nuclear energy. So these, then, the large planetesimals melt, they differentiate, they get a metal core, they get a mantle that's formed of, of less dense silicate minerals. Then there's water that alters some of those minerals. There's heat that alters the minerals. And there's impacts, shocks, when two of these big bodies hit each other that causes more minerals. And this gets you up to about 250 minerals that are, all of these are known from the meteorites that still fall to Earth that are represented in the collections, the great collections here. And so we know these 250 minerals are the building blocks of planets like Earth, and they continuously decorate our surface as they fall to Earth. We then have a period where the crust and the mantle are, are hot and partially molten, and volcanoes are going off, and, and 
lots of activity of that sort. Um, if you have a body like Mercury or the Moon, which is fairly small and has not very much volatile, it's not much water, then you're probably limited at this stage to around 300 mineral species. I think that's all we're going to find total on the Moon. If you have volatiles, though, if you have a water-rich body, you have lots of other things going on. You make um, hydrated minerals like clays. You have evaporite minerals when, when oceans and little ponds dry up. This gets you to above 400 mineral species, and we think that's probably as far as, as Mars has gotten. Now, we have the Curiosity rover to test these hypotheses, these predictions, but I think we're, it's going to be hard-pressed to find more than 400 different mineral species on Mars. Earth's different, though. It's larger. It has more heat. It has a lot of water, so it goes through various processes. The first layer of rock on Earth's surface is called basalt. When you partially melt basalt, the resulting magma is called granite. And granite then contain lots of other minerals. It can concentrate rare elements. You start getting minerals of boron and lithium and beryllium. Uh, uh, tantalum, this is a cesium mineral called polyocyte. This is amazing stuff, these concentrations. It takes a billion years for these minerals to form. A long time of fluid rock interactions. But they form on Earth because Earth has lots of fluids. It has heat. It has time. So. This is, takes us up to about 1,000 minerals uh, at, at Earth aged 1 billion years. And then plate tectonics gets started, and you have huge volumes of fluid rock interaction because you have this subduction process where, where crustal rock, wet crustal rock is taken down. It partially melts. And literally millions of cubic kilometers of the upper mantle and crust are reprocessed, more fluid rock interaction. You form huge ore deposits above these, what are massive sulfide. And many more minerals come into play. And this gets us to about 1,500 mineral species. But as try as we can, we cannot think of any mechanism on a non-living world that gets you beyond 1,500. And yet we have 4,700 minerals on Earth today. And so the conclusion is, is you need biology to give you mineral diversity, which is really kind of a stunning thing to say. Primarily, it's the influence of photosynthetic life, life that produces oxygen. The oxygen completely changes the surface chemistry of Earth. It leads to massive iron deposits. Most of the iron ore reserves in the world come from this period of the great oxidation event. Most of the manganese deposits of the world come from then. And this basically gets us up above 4,500. So we've tripled the number of minerals just by life producing oxygen. And, and that's really an astonishing kind of idea. Again, complexification. All these minerals, turquoise, azurite, malachite, they would not occur on a non-living planet. They simply are not, these require oxygen, and oxygen was not present before life. And then the period of biomineralization, the last few hundred million years, which showed uh, carbonates and silicates and other minerals really transform the surface of the planet. This is mineral evolution. Now, I need to make stress a point again. I talk about mineral evolution. But this word evolution, remember, has several meanings. It, it often means change over time. And this is used by geologists all the time. We talk about evolution of igneous rocks and evolution of meteors, stellar evolution, planetary evolution. We talk about these all the time. It's fine. It in indicates complexification, remember. We see going from 12 to 300 to 500 to 1,000 to 1,500 to 4,500 or more. There's congruency. Each step requires the previous one, but it is not Darwinian evolution. Okay, it's not natural selection, and and so so just remember that that that's that's reserved for biology. Biology is special in that way. Okay, so let's talk about chemical evolution now. This is the next step. Chemical evolution is the origin of life. Natural selection is is or the biological evolution is natural selection. So these two steps. Think about these systems, natural systems. So remember, we've gone from isotopes to elements, elements to minerals, minerals to organic chemistry now, and then that will lead to life. We have a few assumptions about the origin of life. It's, it's carbon-based. There's a chemical process that requires nothing fancy. It's just rocks, oceans, atmosphere. And that you can think of the origin of life as a series of steps, emergent steps, one after another that leads from simplicity to complexity. First, you have to make small biomolecules like amino acids and lipids. You then have to organize these into larger structures, macromolecules, so polymers, membranes of some sort. 
you need a self-replicating system. And once you get that self-replicating system, we'd argue that's when natural selection, that's when Darwinian evolution begins, because you have a system that can make copies of itself that contains information that's passed from one generation to another. Mutations come in, and then <coughs> systems begin to compete, and the most fit system wins. What we talk about in the first step, the emergence of biomolecules, is trying to make carbon-carbon bonds. That's really the challenge here. Um, so you start with simple volcanic gases, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, um, sulfur, and other compounds going from simple CO2, for example, to acetic acid, acetic acid to pyruvic acid with three carbon atoms. So this, this is the kind of very simple chemistry that we want to see. And it turns out that this is really simple. This is a fully understood part of the origin of life. It was done uh, more than 50 years ago by Stanley Miller, the graduate student, Harold Urey, the Nobel Prize winning chemist, both at University of Chicago, building this apparatus, which just stands about that tall. It, you know, you can do this as a benchtop experiment. So you had a little bit of liquid water in the bottom. You had an atmosphere of some gases that they thought might mimic early Earth here. You had little sparks, which are supposed to simulate lightning. And when you did this, you got a series of uh, molecules, an astonishing series of molecules, the building blocks of life, amino acids, sugars, carboxylic acids would play a role in the metabolism, uh, the building blocks of DNA and RNA. It's all there. Lipids. I mean, th this, you really have an amazing assortment thing. In fact, this just looks like a balanced diet, <laughs> <laughs> which, which is which is convinced many people that this was the answer. But in fact, subsequent research has shown there are many other ways to make all these molecules, not just the Miller-Urey scenario. You can do it in deep space, where you have ultraviolet radiation in those dense molecular clouds, where they're tiny, tiny molecules that build larger and larger. So a rich assortment of molecules in deep space that come to Earth on on meteorites, uh, carbon-rich meteorites and asteroids. And um, you can simulate these experiments in the laboratory, for example, in NASA Ames, where they have vacuum chambers that are extremely cold and they shine ultraviolet radiation. You produce these molecules. We also do this at my Carnegie Institution lab, where we specialize in high-pressure, high-temperature research, mimicking the kinds of environments you find on the ocean floor or deep in volcanic systems, where high temperatures and high pressures in mineral-rich situations can lead to amazing organic synthesis. So, so for example, we basically use little gold capsules. We seal reactants. So this is pyruvic acid. That's that three carbon molecule I showed you before. CO2 and water. Just put them in a gold tube, seal it up, run this for a while. And here's the gold tube. This is, these are amazing experiments. It's sort of like magic, because it's just a couple little colorless drops of liquid that go into the capsule. You weld it shut. And a couple hours later, just modest conditions, 200 Celsius couple thousand atmospheres, the kind of conditions you'd find in a subsurface ocean uh, environment. And, and the capsule's all puffed up when you take it out of the high pressure, high temperature reactor. And it's, it's just ready to burst. And, and so you say, OK, there may be some gas pressure in here. You've got to be careful. So you dip it in liquid nitrogen so that it, it freezes down. And then you take your snippers and hold it over a little glass line and go click and go bang. Sorry if you've been sleeping. But, <laughs> but I mean, that's what it does. And it's because it's, it, there's so much gas pressure. And then you drop that frozen capsule into the bottom of the glass vial. And it sits there. And then after a few seconds, it's going <laughs> starts hissing and foaming. And this yellow brown oily goo starts pouring out of the capsule. You can see it here. And it's, this, and it's not a little drop of colorless liquid anymore. And then the aroma, the smell, starts hitting you. And, you know, at lower temperature, it sort of smells sweet like molasses, like at 200, 250. At 300 Celsius, it smells exactly like Jack Daniels. <laughs> and, and it really just fills the lab, and people are walking by, and they say, can I have some? You know, is there a party? <laughs> and, but what this means, though, this, this is really significant stuff, though, because it means we're making a lot of really complex organic molecules, things that, you know, interact with our, with our um, nasal passage, and so we give you that aroma. So, we start to say, well, what are the molecules? And then you do a technique called gas chromatography, where you pass this goo through a long you know, 50 meter or 100 meter column, and the bigger molecules take longer to go through. And so at the other end, you see little pulses. Each one of these peaks is a different organic molecule. And in fact, there are, there's tens of thousands of different things here. And this is actually a problem in origin of life. It's, it's not a problem to make organic molecules. The problem is you make too much. 
and life is very parsimonious. Life only uses a few hundred different molecules, and here we're making thousands. So how in the world do you select and concentrate? So that's the second step. Remember, the first step is making the molecules easy. Second step, selecting and concentrating just the right molecules. So how do you do it? Well, we were puzzled, but my good friend and colleague David Deemer, who's at the University of California, Santa Cruz, said, well, you've tried seeing if they self-organize. And I said, what do you mean, Dave? And he said, well, take a little drop of the stuff, just put it in water and watch it in a microscope and see what happens. So we did that, and lo and behold, some fraction of those molecules that we made just find each other. They self-organize into these beautiful little hollow spheres called vesicles. They have an inside and outside. They're roughly cell-sized. Now, this isn't cells by any means, but what it means is that these molecules have a way of self-organizing, self-selecting in a natural environment. And we now think that this is a fundamental part of the origin of life. Some molecules will self-organize. However, many of the important molecules like sugars and amino acids are water soluble, so they're not going to do this. They have to do something else. And how in the world can you select and concentrate those molecules? And even more puzzling, how can you select and concentrate the left-handed versus the right-handed molecules? Because it turns out that life is highly selective. It uses primarily left-handed amino acids. It uses primarily right-handed sugars. And yet every natural environment we know produces equal numbers of left and right-handed molecules. So, so we predicted that perhaps mineral surfaces could help you in this. There are natural mineral crystals. Go into the mineral museum here and see these beautiful calcite crystals. They have left and right-handed faces. So it turns out select left and right-handed amino acids. So this is at least one way of, of many different ways, I should say of selecting and concentrating molecules. So we think we understand, at least in principle, this part of the origin of life. Admittedly, there is one more step that's really difficult, and that's creating a self-replicating cycle. This has not been solved yet, but there are some really important advances that are going on right now at our laboratory and elsewhere, looking, for example, at what's called the reductive or reverse citric acid cell. You, you probably all at some point had to learn about the Krebs cycle or the TCA cycle, the citric acid cycle. That's this. And it's a series of steps. When it's run in reverse from the normal way, you start with small molecules like CO2, acetic acid, pyruvic acid, which I showed you earlier, and you start adding them together and you go around all the way up to citric acid, which has six carbons. It splits into two plus four, and then you go around, you have two, and then you have four, and then you have eight, and it doubles as it goes around. Furthermore, this is an engine for biological synthesis because from this point you can make amino acids just by adding a nitrogen bearing group and you can go to lipids, you can go through other steps to make the building blocks of DNA and RNA. This is an engine of biosynthesis. So we've gotten most of these steps to go in the laboratory just with minerals as catalysts. It's very important to control the conditions of the experiment and that's one of the, fall, that's one of the failures of previous experiments, but this is a very exciting research. It's the golden, it's the holy grail, if you will. It's the synthesis of this metabolic cycle. What I think if we could do this, if we could get this to sustain in the laboratory, then we really would be able to take this as a system that could evolve, start to mutate and, and carry that information um, to new levels. So that's origin of life, chemical um, evolution. Let's switch gears and talk about systems that aren't part of the natural world as we normally think about it, but also show evol evolution and show aspects of evolution because I think it's key to recognize that this is just a natural process by which things change. So languages, you've all seen trees of languages. This is an evolutionary tree where certain languages are outgrowths of more primitive languages. And there are many, many aspects of this that are familiar to you. For example, languages go extinct. You also have a lot of lateral transfer in languages. So here's Greek down here, here's English up here, but English, we have a lot of English here. We have a lot of lateral transfer. That's something that we see over and over again, where systems are not necessarily isolated from others in their, even though they may have branched, they can still um, learn from the other systems. You also have punctuation in languages. This amazed me. I, I read an article that was in Nature a couple of years ago, and it was analyzing the publication of Webster's Unabridged Dictionary about 200 years ago. That was the first time that standard American spelling, I-Z-E, for example, for, for a surprise and so forth, came into play, and many other words. And if you analyze newspapers in America from 1812 versus 1814, it turns out there is a punctuation event. The language has shifted, and they attribute that to the standardization caused by Webster's 
dictionary. So these are ways of thinking about all kinds of systems, not just living systems. Material culture, and I could have talked about computers or bicycles, but I like trumpets, so I'm gonna talk about trumpets. 400 years ago, this is what a trumpet looked like. Just a long tube of brass, it has a bell at one end, it has a mouthpiece at the other, and it plays the bugle calls. That's all it plays. It can be pretty cool though with music of Bach and Handel, but that's the natural trumpet. Trumpeters got really bored just playing bugle calls, so they tried different things, and, and one of the key inventions, which was around for a little while, 200 years ago, was called the keyed bugle, where here you've now cut holes in the side of that, still have a mouthpiece, still have a bell, but you've cut holes, borrowed directly lateral transfer from clarinets and oboes, and it could play a chromatic scale, and you could play tunes on it. It didn't sound necessarily wonderful, but it wasn't, wasn't bad, and if you were playing outdoors, it really didn't matter if it sounded a little little course. But then of course came along steam engines and engineering technology, airtight valves, and the modern trumpet was invented. And this of course is a fully chromatic instrument. But here the lateral transfer comes from fields outside musical instrument development. It's from the steam engine valves. And there's also a progression of course in music itself and how these instruments are used. And then there's Broadway. And you all came, I know, tonight because it said Big Bang to Broadway, and I promise you I was going to show you. So there's evolution in Broadway musicals. And without trying to be too analytical about it, because, but this is from the 1920s. Right. Okay, I'm going to play that again just because it's so cool. But if you've never been to Broadway, if you've never seen a stage show, this probably was just like the most wonderful thing you'd ever seen in your life and people bought tickets. Oops, I went to the next thing, sorry. Well, okay, you saw that. Now you're gonna see what happened right after the World War II. This is um, um, Carousel and the, bal the dancing is more ballet. It's, it's, it's a much uh, more refined kind of transition from uh, the ballet world. And the music is also, I think, a little more sophisticated. But of course, that's not what Broadway looks like today. Um, it's quite wonderful. So this is uh, Kiss Me Kate. This is when, you know, a period when jazz is really being brought into the Broadway musicals. Oops, sorry about that. Let me go back. Um, yeah, come on, there. <laughs> Okay, so the jazz elements are introduced clearly, and this is not simply a linear chronology, um, but I do need to show you one more because this really represented, if not a punctuation event, certainly a fusion of styles that just had never occurred before. Okay, so as I say, without editorializing, you see a fundamental change in the kinds of things that are put on stage in Broadway. If you go to Broadway today, it's again, it's radically different. The selection process is people buying tickets. And of course, there, there is extinction. Some of these things last a long time and are classics, but many are just sort of fade away and disappear. And without making too strong a point of it, I think you can imagine this is an example of a, a certainly an evolving system um, over time with selection mechanisms. So now, part five, what did Darwin say? Because here, this is, you know, this is biological evolution. When people ask you, do you believe in evolution? They're asking about Charles Darwin and what Darwin said. Well, you need to know what Darwin said, and basically he said something was very, very simple. Is essentially, if I can paraphrase him, there's a cell, the first cell on Earth that doesn't have competition. It basically duplicates over and over again, but it duplicates with some kind of variation. Um, it multiplies rapidly, it fills all kinds of ecological niches, and then because of the mutation you have competition and selection, you have specialization, you have microbes that go into different niches, saltier, wet, uh, you know, drier, uh, hotter, colder, high pressure, deep environments, and so forth. Now, Darwin came to these conclusions, and they're beautifully presented in his 
origin of species, but if you look in detail at the evidence that he presents, a lot of it has to do with this kind of thing, which most of us would look at and call microevolution. The changes in size and shapes of beaks in the Galapagos Islands, you can imagine birds being isolated from each other, and if they're restricted to certain kinds of diets, nuts or insects or, or um, buds and so forth, the beaks are going to be selected on the basis of how easily and how efficiently they can uh, eat on those different islands. And so this kind of diagram, which was so central to understanding what Darwin said, I think probably many people who question the larger issue of evolution don't have any trouble. Microevolution is pretty easy to understand. So, and Darwin was aware of this as well. And, and often this quote is taken out of context to say that Darwin doubted his own theory. It has to do with eyes. I mean, what, of what use is half an eye? And he says, I freely confess it's absurd in the highest possible degree, dot, dot, dot. That's where the creationists leave off. And he said, unless, <laughs> and he said, you know, reason tells me if you have numerous gradations from, from a simple and imperfect eye to a complex and perfect, if you can show that they exist, then it's easy to see how you can go from no eye to an eye. Okay, so this is a prediction that Darwin very explicitly makes, and it's been tested in various ways, and I think to me the most elegant is a computer modeling of eye evolution. It was published almost 20 years ago. Nielsen and Pelger said, let's assume that we have a set of cells on an animal. Imagine this being a worm or, or some sightless um, insect or something. So you have three layers of cells, very typical, topology of, of cells. The outer layer is more or less transparent. The second layer has a group of light sensitive cells. And light sensitive cells are everywhere in nature. Even microbes, there are microbial cultures where if you shine a light on the culture on, on half of a petri dish, the microbes will migrate to the place where it's dark. So, so those are light sensitive cells. They're not eyes, by any means they're just sensing the light. The, this is just a substrate. And, he said, okay, there's three parameters here that are important in terms of describing the eye. One is the curvature, the radius of curvature of this entire system. The second is the distance in the aperture from here to here. The third is the, what's called the refractive index of this colorless, this transparent layer, because that's how much that layer bends light. So look what happens. What they said is, let's do a computer program where we vary those three parameters, the curvature, the aperture, the central refractive index, randomly by plus or minus 1%. And if, and only if, the visual acuity, that is the ability to resolve your surroundings increases, you preserve that variation. And the idea here is that if you have a light sensitive set of cells on your back, then you can sense a shadow going over, that could be a predator. And if you can resolve the direction in which the predator is coming, if you can resolve how far away the predator, even if you can't see the predator in the way we think of, then it increases your possibility of surviving. And, and this is amazing. Look what happens. So at first, you have the flat layer. And after just 176 in this particular simulation, random steps, you have the slight pit. So this is much easier to tell the direction in which something's coming because you, you basically have cells along here in the shadow approaches from one side or the other. And then you go on from there and you start seeing after just a few hundred more steps something that really is beginning to look like an eye pit. And indeed, after roughly a thousand steps in the simulation, you have an eye pit which is almost identical to the morphology of the eye of the limpet. So this is actually seen in nature. But wait, there's more. <laughs> because now you start changing the refractive index in order to make even higher spatial resolution to focus the light. And you go to a few more steps, and roughly, in this case, 1,800 steps. At this point, you have an eye that, given these starting parameters, is as perfectly, I'm not going to use the word designed. Um, it's as perfectly functioning as you can possibly do. If you tried to engineer, if you used intelligent design, and those starting parameters, this is what you would have to come up with. So the point is this. If you run this simulation over and over and over again, you always come up with the same answer. The steps are random. Selection is not. And if you have a system in which you have lots of mutability and you're selecting for things that work, eventually you will arise at a solution that works optimally. It's deterministic. 
if you have a natural system where an organism needs to swim, it's going to have fins, whether it's a mammal or a fish. If you want to fly, you're going to get wings, whether you're a bat or a bird. If you're going to walk, you need legs, an insect or a reptile. This is the power of evolution is that you find solutions that work and only the solutions that work survive. And this is why you can go from simplicity to complexity in a number of steps. And Darwin recognized that fact. So finally, part six, why do I believe in evolution? Well, I believe in evolution because we observe complex systems all the time. We see stars producing elements and isotopes. They, they produce minerals. The minerals help produce prebiotic chemicals and the origin of life. Then life itself evolves. And, and living systems, language, material culture, popular culture. Why should biology be any different? Life evolves. And it evolves by some specific mechanisms, which we call Darwinian uh, natural selection. Why do I believe in evolution? It's because the theory of evolution makes testable predictions. This is an incredibly powerful, I, I've heard so many creationists tell me, oh, but Darwin doesn't make any predictions. That's nonsense. That makes incredible numbers of predictions. Every paleontologist knows this. And so the, the creationists, and this is now old story, but it's a wonderful one. I mean, they, they made a challenge. They said, you know, Oh, how do you get a whale from a land animal? You know, it couldn't possibly survive. We had no hope of survival. And there were a bunch of people that, you know, I remember one, a cow trying to turn into a whale would be an utter failure, was one of the quotes. <laughs> but, but, but this was a challenge to paleontologists. It was a challenge to paleontologists because they said, oh, that's right, you know, we really haven't done enough to look at cetacean evolution, whales and dolphins and so forth. Let's go out and look. And Darwin tells us where to look in shallow marine sediments where whales come to calve, like in Maui. When to look, it's going to have to be someplace in the range of 50 million years to modern times. And, and you should see hind legs in the old whales. And you should see the vestigial hind legs and then them disappearing as you go through. And lo and behold, when they went out and they found Ambulocetetus, the walking whale, which is kind of an awkward looking thing. And, and, but, but hey, when we have seals today, right? We have sea lions. They're kind of awkward looking things too, half land and half. So why not? And, and it isn't like this was evolving to become a whale. This is a perfectly functioning and, 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 and very successful organism all its own. However, some members of this went and spent more time in the water, and you start seeing the legs getting shorter, and you start being more hydrodynamic. This is Rhodocetus 46 million years ago. This is found. It was predicted if we go to these outcrops, we're going to find something like this, and they found them. And then whale evolution, here's Bacillosaurus. This is somewhat more recent, 35 million years or so. You can find these in Alabama. And there was a very perfect skeleton found that had this little vestigial hind legs. You can go to the Smithsonian now in this Hall of Ocean Life and see the Bacillosaurus fossil with these tiny hind legs. Quite amazing. And we're still discovering them. I, I, I helped discover a, a, a new uh, dolphin species, Lophocetus calvertensis, a few years ago. I mean, and, and they're finding hundreds of these. I mean, there's so many new species found all the time. Uh, that's not me, but it's, it's, it is a, fl a very flattering picture, I think. And, and so, I mean, this, so this is just part of paleontology. We find things, we fill in the gaps. So the power of Darwin's theory is that it makes predictions. It tells you where to go, tells you when to go. You go out, you find these things, and you get a good guess what it's going to look like when you find it. I mean, that's predictive power. And no other theory of evolution comes close in that. And finally, why do I believe in evolution? Because the alternative is simply philosophically unacceptable to me. This idea of God in the gaps. I love trilobites. Um, I've been collecting trilobites for 50 years. My collection is now all going to the Smithsonian. If you go there, you can see a bunch of these specimens. And they're amazing. They're absolutely, utterly amazing. You can find them all over the world. You find them in stratigraphic succession. And I look at these and say, how did these many forms, indeed the 20,000 known species of trilobites, how did they arise? And yes, an omnipotent God could have created each one independently, individually. The God could have created each of those whale species independently. But how that trivializes God 
I mean, if you want to believe in God, the idea of God in the gaps. So here's a land animal 50 million years ago. Here's a modern whale. So God must have done it because the whale looks so different. And then you find, you know, Ambulocetus and Bacillosaurus and Rhodocetus and Lophocetus. And, and God, to me, is getting very small. <laughs> and with trilobites, every one of these could be created. But how much more powerful to think about a natural process by which all this diversity and more can arise through a set of laws, a set of laws that's as fundamental and ingrained in our cosmos as the laws of motion, the laws of thermodynamics, the laws of electricity and magnetism. Evolution is a natural process that is a fundamental part of our cosmos. And so I want to end with this closing thought. Look, I realize that this idea is disturbing to some people. We all need to realize that. How can we be created in God's image if there's this random process of mutations and then selection and somehow we just kind of by chance fall that? But no, don't think of it that way. We live in a cosmos that began at a big bang and inevitably, inexorably, hydrogen, helium, lithium came from that event. And from hydrogen and helium came the first generation of stars. And then those stars produced all the isotopes, all the elements, the complete periodic table. And from the periodic table comes Earth-like planets and all its mineral diversity. And from that elemental diversity in the minerals comes the organic chemistry that leads to life, that leads to us, and so to a universe that is learning to know itself. Thank you very much. Oh, absolutely. So we have a few minutes if anyone has any questions. Oh, I see one right in the front. Oh, thank you. Um, sorry, I'm not a scientist. I'm not trained, but I've read a lot of Stephen Jay Gould. Um, and are you saying that, I don't know, in non-biological processes, and like music, is, is, is there no random element in evolution? Am I hearing you right? Like whether it's biological, I think this is a really interesting philosophical question. I do think that in some of these human engineered systems, it's intelligent design. And let's face it, I mean, systems can evolve by design. Intelligent design is not a crazy, wacky idea. I mean, we have wristwatches, we have computers, and those had to be designed, and there's a lateral transfer of traits from one to another. So sure, but what I would argue that is if you want to build an eye, you can have a committee or you can have a computer try to do it. But, but you know, <laughs> If God's smart, she would have chosen evolution, not intelligent design. Okay, that's, I mean, that's sort of the argument I would make. Yes? How long have we had the kinds of um, minerals or chemicals that are necessary to start life? <laughs> We, uh, Andy and I and, and others in this community talk about this all the time. I think very early on, I think virtually every mineral that someone evokes as a possible aspect of origin of life was present very, very early in Earth history, except for one group of minerals called the borates. But very early on, and in many planets, you know, probably within the first billion years of cosmic evolution, these minerals existed on, on planets that were Earth-like. And so, so this, is, this is a very robust part of the cosmos. This is not, there's no special pleading that's needed for, for this kind of chemistry. Let's see, I should. Go to the sides. I see one over here. Please. So, so the question was, could any, um, I guess, science that we knew that there was a recording of a bomb, NASA has found that the group would grow organic uh, elements on Mars? On Mars. This is the curiosity. Well, so the question, or this comment was that apparently NASA today, do you know about this? NASA announced that they find organic they molecules on Mars? They found a lot of salts. They found uh, clays. Yeah. And there are some odd compounds that are methylated. OK, methylated. So this is carbon, hydrogen. And, and they, those, I guess, it's still not clear whether those took the trip from okay. Canaveral or Yeah. yeah. And, and, and you know, this, kind of dis this kind of discovery that NASA announced is very important. But let's face it, the shocking, the absolutely shocking newsworthy comment would be no organics found on Mars. That would be 
shocking and unbelievable because organics are coming in all the time through, through meteorites and, and we're quite sure there'd be subsurface processes that could potentially lead to organics. So now whether this indicates life, we don't know, but you know, follow the carbon. That's one of NASA's mottos right now, follow the carbon. And, and knowing that there are those molecules, that's, that's so, I heard it first from you, thank you. <laughs> that's really fun. Yes, please. And, and this, okay, the question was how does increasing complexity fit with entropy? And if you know your second law of thermodynamics, you know there's this tendency in the universe for, for energy to disperse, heat to spread out, systems to become more disordered with time. But when you have an interface through which energy is passing through all the time, the sunlit surface of Earth, a hydro vent, hydrothermal vent on the ocean floor, you have lots of interfaces, then it actually turns out that dispersing that heat energy or making things more disordered can be accelerated by having highly ordered systems at the interface. I, I, that may, maybe that's too complicated. Think of your brain. I mean, your brain is an incredibly ordered system, but it uses up energy just at a prodigious rate. If you had all the molecules in your brain just like and there was CO2 and water, it wouldn't do anything. But now that you're thinking about it, you're just churning out, you're just using up energy in an incredible rate. So it turns out these complex evolving systems accelerate entropy simply because they're, they're locally ordered. I mean, it's, it's an interesting way of thinking. Neil, Ilya Prigogine talked about this, what he called dissipative systems. And there's a whole non-equilibrium thermodynamics. He won the Nobel Prize for this. Um, so it's, it's fairly well understood and, and by him more than me. But, 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 but that's, that's, the, that's the crux of it, that, that we're basically little entropy, entropy producing machines. Yes, please, ma'am. What can you do with the question of um, this constant emergence of molecules? Um, what happens to the energy that they produce? In the end of my book, Genesis, I kind of do some wild speculation, but not as wild as some other authors. I, I, I refer you to Harold Moritz's book called The Emergence of Everything. Oh, the question, I'm sorry, the, the question was, you see these emergent systems one after another leading to us, leading to consciousness, the universe that knows itself, blah, blah, blah. So what's next? What's next? Is there something next? Is there something higher? Well, I will first make the observation that if you are in the middle of an emergent system, if we are all individual agents in the, some emergent system, it's very hard to recognize the emergence from what you are. A neuron doesn't know it's conscious. A sand grain, you know, is not, if, well, yeah, obviously not aware that it's part of a sand dune. But so it's very hard, it's hard to know. So Harold Morowitz has written a book called The Emergence of Everything. Here he's a, he was a theoretical biologist at Yale and is now a professor at George Mason University. And which the last chapter really speculates on spirituality in a way that's, that's quite interesting, but it's not scientific and he acknowledges it's not. But you do, you can think beyond that. But, but I think, you know, basically right now, as far as we know about the knowable universe, you know, you know the way that science has somehow seemed to take the human being farther and farther away from what seems to be important and, you know, we're no longer the center of the universe, this, we go around the sun, we're no longer the only Earth-like planet, the only solar system, or, you know, it's like their galaxy is far, far away. And, and it sort of makes us, you feel smaller and smaller and smaller. And we're just, we're, we're just an animal, you know, we're no longer special in that way. Well, if you want to think about it a different way in terms of emergent complexity, the center of the universe, the most complex thing we know, there is no higher level of emergence than right between your ears. And so if you want to feel good for a second about, <laughs> about us being special, just, so it's not a, we're not special in terms of time or place, but we are kind of special in terms of emergent complexity because of the things that our brain can do that no other system in the universe that we know of so far can do. And we may be one of many, but so far we don't know that. Over here, please. Could you comment on the evolution of intelligence? Do you agree with writers like Simon, Tom, and Morris who think that intelligent life is more or less inevitable, or do you like Morris agree with Stephen Jay Gould who says, rewind the tape and nothing happens intelligence is like the Oh man, I just don't know. Okay, this is, the question had to do with whether, whether 
intelligence is inevitable or deterministic or, or stochastic contingent, you know, and Gould's on one side and Simon Conway, Conway Morris is on the other side. And, and I, I just don't think we have enough information about that. I, I just, I honestly, I don't know. Um, it's a wonderful question. But is intelligence some really strange, weird, quirky thing that just happened because of chance circumstances? Or, or would it have been inevitable in the next 100 million years? Remember that multicellular life is a very, very short phenomenon. Um, and, and, and the kind of complex life that, that you know, Andy Knoll could talk on this much better than I could. But the, the period of Earth history during which intelligence might have arisen is very, very short. Uh, you know, just a few percent of the whole history. So, so it's, it's really hard for us to, to know for sure, I think. Um, let me take this question here. Exactly. Oh boy, and these are these are these like deep late night. I need a beer. Okay, <laughs> you're asking me. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean we we wouldn't be here talking about it unless the universe was at least in some so that we could have emerged to this point. And so people have looked at and you know, say there's you know 20 or so parameters that if if you just define all 20 parameters and that's the the, the constant in um, the electrostatic equation and the force of gravity and a bunch of other things, nuclear forces and so forth. If, if any of those changes, and some of them if they only change by a slight, slight amount, then carbon doesn't become an element and so all the carbon chemistry that life depends on doesn't happen and, and you say, well, but of course then we wouldn't be here to talk about it, would we? So <laughs> who knows? I don't know. I mean, maybe there is a multiverse. Maybe there is you know, a combinatorically vast number of universes each with a different combination of these special parameters and the only way we're going to be standing here to talk about it is if we're in one of the universes that has or maybe this is the only one I don't know and if it's the only one does that imply that there really is a creator because the creator was intelligent enough to go I don't know I don't know I, I mean you know I'm not paid to do that but oh well no no I, I'm I appreciate it very much it's fun thank you very much <laughs>